If you would bow your head with me and pray. Father, it's great to be in your house with your people, hear conversation and laughter and joy of being yours, God. And that's something we could never do on our own, but only because of your gracious love of us, God, to create us, to redeem us, to stay faithful even when we are unfaithful. So we come uh, boldly and expectantly this morning, uh, not to hear from Isaac, but to hear from you through your word. And I'm grateful to be uh, a minister of such a beautiful gospel, the gospel of Jesus Christ. Lord, bless this time. We ask for your Holy Spirit to be so present. In Jesus' name, amen. If you, uh, if you were here on Mother's Day, you might have noticed a couple of beautiful uh, pots of impatience outside. They were large, really, really massive. Uh, they looked fantastic. And if you didn't catch it on Mother's Day or the week after that, chances are you didn't catch it at all because they... Uh, or should I put this? They were forcibly donated, if you will. I came in one day and one was gone. Hey, I like followers. I get it. Uh, I hope they're serving a good purpose. And then a couple days later, the second one was gone. I can't we just have one flower. Um, so I hope they're doing amazing things wherever they are and thriving and, and being watered and well taken care of. But stealing donating, whatever you want to call it, isn't something that's unique to our front steps here at the church. If you listen to the news, you might have heard a lot about carjackings going on lately. It seems like there's a, a huge string of carjackings all over the city. Even, even in River North, that's when you know like things are, things are really spreading everywhere. But it's not just in the city that things have been or are getting stolen. I remember growing up and I live, like, in the boonies. Like, the closest town, 15 minutes away, is a thousand people. And I remember I had just set out some money on a bedside table the night before, all my money that I had, to go on, like, a one-day trip. It wasn't a lot of money, but it's all I had. And the next day, I went blissfully to a brewer's game, as one does. And on the way there, my mom called and said, who did you tell that you went to the game? I don't know. <laughs> what, what's going on? I can't tell you, but it was like very strange. Come to find out somebody had broken into my parents' home and taken, I discovered later, my cash on my bedside table. I had forgotten about that until I started working on the sermon. I was like, oh, that's right. There was a body. Go on, see ya. But this is something part of our story, even as a nation. Taking what isn't ours. We think about building a nation off land that wasn't ours. Forcibly taken. We think about building a nation with people who were stolen from their land. It's, it's part of who we are as a people. That's who you and I are as people as well. We often take what isn't ours to suit our purposes. Whether it's due to our great need or our great greed, we are adept at looking at others in their possessions and seeking to take them and use them for our own benefit. But you and I are called to be a different sort of person, a different sort of people. Not a taker, but a giver, if you will. And I want to ask you this morning, are you someone who takes? Are you someone who gives? Because we are to be a people who don't take what isn't yours, but instead seek to give what we have been given. Turn with me to Exodus chapter 20, verse 15. We're going to look at the next commandment, the eighth one. We have two more left. Then we're going to be starting a series on the Lord's Prayer in August, just to give you a little sneak peek. Exodus 20, verse 15, the eighth commandment, says this. You shall not steal. Following in line with the previous commandments, very short, very brief. You shall not steal. You shall not plot to connive to take what does not belong to you. I put it this way. Don't take what isn't yours. The nation of Israel leaving Egypt, leaving slavery and oppression, going to their promised 
land, and the Lord knows you're going to accumulate more possessions than you've had. And as a community, he's, he's building a structure that says, your possessions are part of, part of who you are, in a sense. He's establishing, there's some ownership that you have over your possessions. And they're, in a sense, almost an extension of yourself. So if somebody takes yours, or if you take someone else's, you're violating that person. You're causing harm upon their being by taking their possessions. Over the next couple chapters, you see the punishments laid out for stealing. You would have to return back double of what you stole, unless it was kidnapped. And then the punishment was death. And if you look through some of the punishments in the Old Testament, some are really strong responses. And paying back double might seem like a lot, but I'm sort of surprised that it's not actually as bad as I anticipated. And I wonder if part of this is the recognition that it's stealing. Taking what isn't yours can come about for so many different reasons. Two that come to mind right away is you can take out a great meat. You're hungry and you need food. Or you can take out of great greed. You feel like you, you constantly need more. You need more time, money, and resources to uh, amass your own kingdom. Your own pursuits. I'm going to be focusing more on the second part, the taking out of great greed this morning. But I'll, I'll touch on the first part as well a little bit. It's interesting to know that the people of Israel, their their very founder was a person, a, a thief. Jacob, who was later renamed Israel, who had 12 sons who were the founders of the, the tribes of Israel, he stole his brother's blessing, which was a huge deal back then. And this was just part of the, the, who Jacob was. He, his name means deceiver. This is part of their culture as a people. This is part of their, their identity. God said, I want to make sure that you don't continue to take this with you. I'm not about just keeping you who you are. I'm about transforming you as a people. So he's putting this in there. Don't take what isn't yours. It's not just Israel the person. It's not just Israel the people who are adept at this as well. You and I, we, we have this inclination. Oftentimes without even thinking about it, planning it, it just comes almost as second nature, if you will. It is at work that we take company time and do our own things with it. Maybe it's just scrolling on Facebook, maybe it's pursuing our own pursuits, our own hobbies. It's okay, it doesn't matter. But really that's the time that is devoted to our job. Maybe it's a more subtle theft like plagiarism, where you take someone else's words, their concepts, their ideas, and you appropriate them for yourselves and don't give the proper credit. I hesitate to even say this, but maybe it's the tax due to be given to the city or the country. As a caveat, there's plenty of legal and wise ways of handling your money so you don't have to pay just the, the, the most amount. So we can talk about that later. But there's a lot of also unethical ways of not reporting what you owe, etc. You think they don't need it. Or maybe it's the honor that should be given to God. The credit given to God. When you think about the fact that He has given us everything. Literally, I woke up this morning because of the breath that God gave me. I, I can do work because of the life that God has given me, the strength that He's given me. But man, if you're like me, we love to have this concept of that. I earned it. I earned it so I can do what I want with it. Love it. That's, that's not a Christian concept. Yeah. To do this and to sort of slodge our conscience, we have to demonize or dehumanize the other entities, other people. Church doesn't need those flowers. I'm sure they've got plenty of money, they can give more. The city doesn't need our money, and they're ridiculous. I call them, and they you know, and the list goes on. Or we dehumanize people. They're not actually made fully in the image of God, so we can use them for our purposes. My boss, he's ridiculous. 
This is nobody's doing. So I'm going to do my own thing on my own time, which is actually his or hers. But the command is simple. Don't take what is yours. Instead, seek to give what you have been given. This is a really hard thing to do. To shift your mindset, to shift your perspective, to be that sort of person, to be a, a different kind of person is actually impossible to do on your own. It requires something. It requires grace. The very gift of God, the, the favor of God given to us. Praise God, we can't do it on our own, bless you, Sabbath. We can't become new people on our own. We can't just work harder to be more of a, a giving person. God does this work in us by His Holy Spirit. I want to share a couple stories about how God changes lives. One focusing at the, the stealing from me, the other focusing on stealing from Greek. The first one going to be looking at uh, literature, the other one looking at the Gospels, also literature. But you might have heard the story of Les Miserables. The French isn't great, but it's adequate. And uh, the character Jean Valjean, which I think is one of the best names out there. Sorry, Calloway. <laughs> this character is tremendous. He, uh, he stole some bread early on in the story, gets thrown into prison for five years, tries to escape, winds up being in prison for almost 20 years, and he gets out, and he's a, he's a thief. He finds himself in a wealthy bishop's home, and needing money, he does what he does, and he takes some candlesticks, silver candlesticks. And when he's caught by the authorities and looking at now a much stricter penalty, his life is changed because the bishop actually says, now, nah, he didn't take those. I gave them to him. In fact, I, I meant to give him some more. You see, the, the power of someone giving what they've been given, it's, it's much stronger than the power of someone taking out of me. He says, no, I'm actually going to give that to him. And he changes Jean, Jean Valjean's life forever. And it's an amazing story of the power of grace over and against the power of the law. And Victor Hugo, amazing author, drawing attention to a lot of the social woes going on. The fact that somebody was thrown into prison for five years because they stole bread because they were hungry. Another story from Luke 19 about a, a man named Zacchaeus. I didn't throw up a picture because honestly I felt like a tree deserved a little bit more attention. And you can't see him in the tree, but trust me, he's in there. But the story goes like this. Jesus is on his way to Jerusalem. He's on his way to die. And he knows this. And he's going to this town called Jericho, and there's this man in the town who's called the chief tax collector. And the gospel describes him as being very rich. And tax collectors get their money by essentially stealing from people, common people, poor people. Because they're getting taxes for the Roman government, and then to get their wage, the government just said, well, you determine how much more you want to ask for. And you have the, the weight and the authority of the Roman government behind you make sure that you get that. So he's rich. He's built his empire, his own personal empire, if you will, off of stealing from the poor, from oppressing. But clearly Zacchaeus is not content. Clearly there's something in his life that says, I have not found what I've been looking for, because he hears that there's someone walking to his town named Jesus. Zacchaeus, who's been following the, the, the one who referred to as Satan, the one who steals, kills, and destroys, has heard that there's one who gives life and life abundantly, and Zacchaeus wants that, but he's short. So he climbs up in a tree. And praise God that Jesus, when he comes, he looks to change people's lives. Everyone's now. And Zacchaeus is trying to get a look at Jesus, and what actually happens is Jesus gets a look at Zacchaeus, and he says, Zacchaeus, I'm coming to your house today. And Zacchaeus is so excited, he's coming down, and everyone starts rolling and complaining. He's a, he's a tax collector. Do you know who he is? Why are you going to his house? His house, the house built off of oppression. The house built off of stealing. 
Jesus wants to go to that house and transform that house. And Zeke, he is recognizing it. It is filled with great joy. And this is how he responds. He said, Lord, I'll give half of my possessions to the poor. And if I have extorted anything from anyone, I'll pay back four times as much. Think back to Exodus where you would pay back double. He's saying, I'm going to do twice as much as that. Zacchaeus is responding to the, the gracious gift of salvation of Jesus by saying, no, 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 I'm going to make it right and above and beyond. I don't want to say too much, but I also don't want to say too little in this moment. Because we see all around us, we see in scripture that the stealing from greed leads to the stealing from need. So what, what do you mean by that? We see the, the fact that when the powerful, the mighty, those in charge take from those who can't defend themselves, those who don't have as many rights, those who aren't as privileged, situations are now presented where people are having to make decisions to survive decisions out of need in which stealing becomes much more of a viable option. We see this. That as a nation, when we've, we've had centuries of stealing going on, and then we wonder why there's situations where stealing for others who need, in need becomes a much more viable option. And it wasn't just something that happened centuries ago. We think about landlords who live far removed from their communities who are charging absolutely as much as they possibly can with no concern for the tenants, who are taking out of greed, forcing others to potentially take out of need. Or we think about employers who are seeking to pay as little as possible so they can make as much as possible, so they can have the most excessive margin. Praise God that we serve a God whose grace, whose gift given to us is more powerful than all of that. We see that in both of these stories. I think about Jeff Bezos. He gets a, he gets a lot of flack, so maybe Elon Musk. But these people fighting to get to space, and I wonder, is this a Zacchaeus moment? Like, are you trying to get, get higher so maybe you can see something you haven't seen before? I pray, and literally I was practicing this and I started to pray. I was like, God, what would it look like if Jeff Bezos went to space and came back and his life was dramatically changed? Not from the guilt of people saying like, Jeff, you know, if you did this with your money, look at what could happen with Jeff. Guilt doesn't change people. Grace changes people. What would happen if Jeff comes back from space? And there's a, there's a, a petition out there that he not come back from space, FYI. <laughs> it has like over 120,000 signatures. But people are like, look, we don't want you. Ah, uh, I want you. And I want all your money to do amazing things on earth. God, go get it. Change his life in the name of Jesus. Go up there, look for something, and find Jesus watching you and saying, no, 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 I'm coming to your house. Come back and say, I'm giving away half of what I own. Imagine the good that can be done. That's the power of the gospel. It sounds like that would be crazy, but that's just a person's life changed by the power of the gospel. The power of the Jesus that you and I see. Let me bring it back down to where we're at. Because it's easy to get passionate about others giving. Look at it again. We need to do that. Sort of shirk around our own responsibility. God's not going to hold you accountable for other people's actions. So seek to give what you have been given. Paul in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 28 says this He says, Let the thief no longer steal, but rather let him labor, doing honest work with his own hands so that he may have something to share with anyone in need. Paul's not just writing this because it's an interesting topic. He knows who's in the church. And he knows that, hey, there are people who this is how they, they make it. They, they, they take from others. He said, no, stop doing that. Stop. Go work. But he doesn't say so that you can provide for yourself and you can 
have enough for yourself. He says so that he may have something to share with anyone in need. The power of the gospel, I'm not just saying you know, go and, and take for yourself in an honest way. I'm saying go take so that you can give. John Wesley put it this way. He said, make all we can, save all we can, give all we can. We know that we sort of we recognize the first part of that, make all you can, save all you can. But John Wesley firmly believed in a simple life as well. That you're not just living off of the most that you can live off of. When your income rises, you just say, okay, I can continue to live off more and more. You say, no, this is what it takes to live on, and now I'm going to give the rest. I'm going to save, I'm going to be a good steward. He said, do that as much as you can by the power of the Holy Spirit. But this requires a, a shift in our perspective. I'm going to draw attention to three things, and there could be more. But I just wanted to highlight these. It requires a shift from, I need more, to I have enough. A shift that settles in contentment. Paul writes, he says, Godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into the world, and we can take nothing out of it. But if we have food and clothing, we will be content with that. Uh, the second shift that needs to happen is a, a shift from they owe me to how can I bless them? A shift that goes from comparing to caring. A shift that goes from blaming to blessing. A shift that when you enter the presence of God and you say, God, I don't even know how to pray about this situation. I, I would encourage you to pray. How can I bless this person? How can I bless these people, God? I might not even want to because my flesh is really strong. But Jesus, help me by the power of the Holy Spirit to bless them. Paul in Romans 13, right after talking about giving taxes to Rome, which I would argue is... a, a probably not the most encouraging entity to give taxes to. Right after that, he says this, Owe no one anything except to love each other. For the one who loves another has fulfilled the law. And then he references the commandments. He says, For the commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet. And any other commandments are summed up in this word. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no wrong to a neighbor, therefore love is the fulfilling of the law. You see, we're a different sort of people. We don't do this to earn salvation, but when God saves us, He turns us from a taker into a giver. You see, have that sort of mentality that isn't saying, look, you owe me, how can I take as much as possible from you? To say, look, how can I bless you? How can I be a conduit of the blessing of Jesus Christ? The last shift of perspective, and I mentioned it earlier, a shift from I earned it to I received it. In Ephesians 2, verses 8 through 10, it says this, For by grace, by a gift, the salvation given to us, for by grace you have been saved through faith. That's our response to it. This is not your own doing. It is the gift of God. Not a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, those good works which God prepared beforehand, that we should walk in them. Even the good works that we can be tempted to say, I, I did them. God has prepared beforehand for us. Beloved, don't take what is in yours. Instead, seek to give what you have been given. Here are a couple of thoughts and ideas about. What should we do when we walk away from you? How can we cultivate uh, being a giving people? The first is set goals for giving. Don't think it's just going to automatically sort of happen. Naturally. Organically just going to grow as a giver. Chances are your flesh will probably grow a little bit more organically than the spirit. Because it's sometimes a little bit stronger if we don't lean into what the Lord wants us to do. Huso Gonzalez put it this way. It's a long quote. I have it on the back. It says, The gift of giving must be exercised in order to be developed. 
Just as a good physical fitness program exercises the whole body, so does the gift of giving need to be exercised simultaneously with, the, with all the things we have received in order to give, with money, other resources, words, and time. At some points, like any fitness program, it will be painful or unexciting, and we may be tempted to interrupt the exercise regime. And yet, as we continue exercising the gift of giving, we will see it develop just as we see our muscles developing with physical exercise. Slowly, but undeniably, our joy in giving will increase in this, not just because we will be more accustomed to you, but even more so because the Christ who lives in us will find expression in our deeds. The gift himself, Jesus, the one who lives in us, he himself will find expression in our deeds. Church, I want to encourage this. As I was writing this this past week, my heart was so grateful to be a part of a community that flows in giving. I wasn't writing this thinking like, man, how do I convince people that they need to be a giving people? I was writing this thing, man, God, thank you. Thank you that this is the, the, the people that we are. Thank you for the, 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 the men and women around me who give up time, who give up resources. Joe and Rachel, I think about you guys and hosting volleyball and hosting all of these things and creating a space in your house for, for people to live. I think about Zach Jenry hosting basketball twice a week. It's two evenings a week. Space for, for people to come and play basketball. I think about the, the women who part of cross streets, giving up their time and their energy. Faithfully, week in and week out, to serve women in our community. Drew and Becca, Tasha, Stelsos, the list goes on, but thinking about the food giveaway, making that happen for over a year now. We are a giving people. And I praise God because it's encouraging to me to be a part of a people like this. And I just wanted to tell you, continue on. Continue on. Find the joy in giving. A couple more things I would say. The blood drive on Sun on Tuesday. Look, I was squeamish about giving blood. I pass out like a body. So if you're that person, it's okay. Uh, but what a great way to give up the very life blood of us to bless somebody else. You might have heard of what's going on in Cuba. Crazy. We're going to be looking to take a donation and we're trying to figure out as a church uh, the best way because it's a little bit complicated to raise money to send to Cuba. So I'll keep you informed about that. But be praying for Cuba. Be praying for New Life Havana. Pastor Michael down there. And lastly, share Jesus. The greatest gift that we have been given the relationship with Jesus Christ, the one who has changed our lives, the one who we look to to change the situation around us, share that with him. Give that to him. Can I ask you to stand with me as we close here before we grab some ice cream downstairs? Lord, I thank you for this morning. I thank you that we are your people. Recipients of the grace of Jesus Christ that cost you everything. You who became poor so that we could become rich, God. Not primarily financially, but far beyond, far better than that. The riches, the riches of your grace, of knowing you, of being in relationship with you, of being part of your community, community of God himself. Lord Jesus, we say thank you. Lord Jesus, we ask that as we go from here, Lord, that we would go by the power of the Holy Spirit, God, that we would have moments this week where we would see, am I going to be a giver or am I going to be a taker in this moment? I pray that we would give and we would find great delight in that. God, I pray that you would move in a powerful way, God, in those who have resources that could be used for tremendous good, Lord. I think about it. Jeff Bezos and Elon Musk and others. God, we ask, you do a mighty work, God. We, we ask for you, the grace of the Lord Jesus to change them, God. And it would be a testimony that would give glory to you, God. 
Lord, we ask for our, our brothers and sisters in Cuba. God, we ask that you would sustain them and keep them, God. That you would protect them, Lord. We ask for your help in that situation, God. Would you move in a mighty way, Jesus? Lord, as we go forward from here, I pray that you bless our time. Pray you bless our time eating ice cream, God, that we would experience the delight of the Father poured out on the Son, given to us by the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. Be blessed, church.